Let's turn to the first step of the color coding approach. So the responsibility here is to color the vertices of a graph in K colors, where K is the target path length we're looking for, so that some minimum cost K path of the graph turns monochromatic, so that for some optimal path, each of its vertices gets a distinct color. Only problem is, how on earth are we ever going to do that when we have no idea what the minimum cost K paths look like? After all, that's what we're trying to find in the first place. So here we're going to have to bring out another tool from our toolbox, one we actually haven't seen in a while, randomization. The hope is that a uniformly random coloring, meaning for each vertex we independently assign it one of the K colors, each equally likely, the hope is that a uniformly random coloring actually has a decent shot at turning an optimal K path uh, to become panchromatic. If that is the case and we get lucky, then we can relatively efficiently recover that path using the dynamic subroutine uh, that we just, dynamic programming subroutine that we just designed. In this quiz, let's think through just what is the probability that a given K path is turned panchromatic under a uniformly random coloring. All right, so the correct answer is the fourth one, answer D, K factorial divided by K raised to the K. So let's start with the number of different things that could happen. So we've got our K path, capital P. It's got K different vertices. Each of its vertices is going to be assigned a color from one through K uniformly at random, which means there's K different things that could happen to the first vertex of P, K different things that could happen to the second vertex, and so on, up to K different things that could happen to the Kth vertex, which means there's k to the k possible colorings of the k vertices in this path capital P. And by definition, each of those is equally likely. Each of the colorings happens with probability exactly one over the number of possibilities, one over k raised to the k. Question number two is about the numerator. So of all of these k to the k possibilities, in how many of them does this path P wind up being panchromatic? So the claim here is that the answer is k factorial. Why? Well, imagine we sort of first choose which vertex is going to get color number one, say colored red. There are K different choices for which vertex winds up the red one. Now we want to sort of figure out which vertex is green. Well, it has to be one of the K minus one uncolored vertices. So those are the number of choices we have for a green vertex. Then we have K minus two remaining choices for a yellow vertex and so on, all the way down to one choice remaining for that last color. So that gives us K factorial of the K to the K colorings, give us a panchromatic path. So how should we interpret that answer? I mean, K factorial and K to the K are both growing pretty quickly with K. So what does their ratio look like? So for short, let's uh, denote this ratio by lowercase p. How can we get a feel for it? Well, in the numerator, we have this K factorial. And remember, a, a couple of videos ago, I showed you a, a really good approximation for the factorial function, Sterling's approximation. Back then, in the context of the TSP, I was just trying to illustrate uh, how much faster a 2 to the n time algorithm is than an n factorial time algorithm. Here, actually, Strong's approximation will play a much more direct role. Let me mind you, remind you what it says. Strong's approximation says that n factorial is very well approximated uh, by n over e. Here, e is 2.718 dot dot dot. So the ratio n over e raised to the nth power times a leading term, square root of 2 pi n. Before, we were content to just notice that n over e to the n is a lot bigger than 2 to the n for even modest values of n. Here, let's actually plug in this formula for the factorial function uh, to simplify our ratio p. So we're going to plug in Sterling's approximation for the numerator with n with k playing the role of n. Noting that the two k to the k terms cancel out, we can simplify this expression as follows. So this looks pretty bad. Our probability of success p, meaning the probability that we transform a given k path into a panchromatic path using a uniformly random coloring, uh, that's, going, that's decreasing exponentially fast with k. You can see that e to the k in the denominator. So in fact, even if you just plug in k equals 7, uh, this is already less than 1%, which 
which is kind of a bummer. On the other hand, who says we have to stop with just one uniformly random coloring? It's a randomized algorithm. It's going to do different things the more times we run it. So we could just do a bunch of independent random trials. Keep trying different colorings. Keep invoking our dynamic programming subroutine for computing the min cost panchromatic path. And over all of our trials, we just remember the best of all of the panchromatic paths that we ever see. We only need to get lucky once. If even one of our random colorings winds up turning an optimal k-path panchromatic, our dynamic sub programming subroutine is guaranteed to find it. So the question is not so much, you know, what is the probability that a single experiment uh, succeeds? The probability, the question is, how many trials do we need before we're going to succeed in at least one trial with probability at least, say, 99%? Well, here there's a very clean answer. Let's build it up step by step. Let's start with just one trial. So one trial succeeds with probability p, which is pretty small. So it fails with probability 1 minus p, which is pretty big. We're not going to stop at one trial. We're going to do capital T independent random trials. Well, capital T is a parameter we get to pick. We want to know how big do we need to set capital T to get what we want. So if one trial fails with probability 1 minus p, the second trial also fails with probability 1 minus p, and so on. All of these trials are independent, so the probabilities multiply meaning that the probability that all capital T trials fail is 1 minus P, the failure probability of one trial, raised to capital T, the number of trials. And if this does not happen, if it is not the case that all capital T of the trials fail, then at least one of them succeeded. And that's exactly what we care about. So the probability that at least one trial is successful is going to be 1 minus this quantity, quantity 1 minus P raised to the capital T. So that may look a little messy, 1 minus quantity, 1 minus p raised to the t. Uh, to simplify things, let's remember something that actually came up a few videos ago, which is the close relationship between the linear function 1 minus x and the exponential function e to the minus x. We were discussing this back when we were talking about why does that magical quantity for maximum coverage and influence maximization, 1 minus quantity, 1 minus 1 over k raised to the k, why does that converge to 63.2%? So back then we were using the one minus x and e to the minus x are pretty close to each other uh, when x is close to zero. Here we're going to use the fact that e to the minus x is always at least as big as one minus x. So one minus x is a linear function, e to the minus x is a curve that kisses it right at zero. So if we plug in in particular x equal to p, then what we discover from this graph is that one minus p is bounded above by e to the minus p. And now that's a lot easier to handle. We have e to the minus p raised to the capital T, but then that just becomes e raised to the minus p times t. Meaning our success probability that at least one of the trial, uh, one of the trials succeeds is at least one minus uh, e to the minus p t. And what's really important here is that the probability that all of the trials fail, that's decreasing really quickly with capital T. That's decreasing exponentially as we take more and more independent random trials. Going back to our original question, how big do we need to take capital T? How many trials do we need so that we succeed with probability at least 99%? Well, that's a failure probability of at most 1%. So what we do is we're just going to set this failure probability bound that we have, e to the minus pt. We're going to set that equal to a parameter delta, where your delta would be like 0.01. So now we can solve for the number of trials capital T as a function of delta. We find that as long as we take at least 1 over p, p is the success probability, times log 1 over delta, where delta is the failure probability we're willing to tolerate, that many trials is enough to get us at least one success with probability at least 1 minus delta. So for example, if our success probability of one trial, p, was like 1%, that 1 over p term would turn into a factor of 100. And if we set delta to be 0.01, meaning we want a 99% success rate, then that's going to add, multiply the 100 by something like 5. So it's going to tell you that take 500 trials and you're good to go. You should succeed almost all the time on at least one of them. In the context of color coding, where we're taking these uniformly random colorings to turn k-paths panchromatic, we know what our success probability p is. It's uh, root 2 pi k over e to the k. That was our Stirling approximation that got us that. And so that gets flipped in the number of trials. So the number of trials we're going to need, the number of times we need to experiment with uniformly random colorings before we're likely to have had at least one success where a given k-path turned panchromatic, that's going to be uh, e to the k divided by root 2 pi k times this log of 1 over delta factor. Now, this may seem extravagant, this exponential in k number of trials, 
But don't forget, we're already in our dynamic programming subroutines spending time uh, exponential in K. So this exponential in K is just going to multiply with that one, and we'll have ballpark the same type of running time. So just to make sure that it's clear how all the ingredients fit together, let me go ahead and show you the pseudocode. The first thing the algorithm does is compute how many random trials it needs, and that's what we just sort of figured out on the previous slide. So it's going to be e to the k divided by root 2 pi k times log 1 over delta, where delta is this user-supplied failure probability. Now we're just going to run capital T independent random trials. Each trial, we pick a fresh, new, uniformly random coloring. Each trial, we invoke our panchromatic path subroutine to find the minimum cost uh, panchromatic path for that particular coloring. And then we just remember the best path that we ever see over all of the trials. That is the color coding algorithm. So it does a whole bunch of independent random trials, and in each independent trial, it experiments with a uniformly random coloring of the vertices. Each trial you know, might succeed or might not, it might fail. Um, what do I mean by that? Succeed means that at least one of the minimum cost k-paths becomes panchromatic, in which case that path or some equivalently good path will be found by the dynamic programming subroutine, or it could fail, meaning that this coloring actually winds up turning none of the minimum cost k paths of the graph panchromatic, removing all of them from the subroutine's consideration. So in that failure case, the subroutine, you know, maybe it returns plus infinity, if in fact the coloring meant there were no panchromatic paths at all. Or if the subroutine returns a panchromatic path, it can't be a minimum cost one because none of them were panchromatic in the failure case. So it's gonna be some k path of the original graph with strictly higher cost. But the point is, we only need one of these trials to succeed. If at least once we wind up coloring the vertices so that some minimum cost k-path becomes panchromatic, then this algorithm will be correct. And of course, we've chosen the number of trials capital T uh, so that the success probability is exactly what we wanted it to be, at least one minus delta. How about the running time of the algorithm? Pretty much all the algorithm does is run these capital T independent random trials. So the running time is just gonna be the number of trials capital T times the running time per trial. So the number of trials we'd ex we computed explicitly, it's e to the k divided by root two pi k times log one over delta. Let's just be a little bit sloppy with the upper bound and forget about that root k factor. Let's just call the number of trials O of uh, e to the k times log one over delta. The time of a trial is completely dominated by the invocation of the dynamic programming subroutine for computing a minimum cost panchromatic path. And if you recall, the running time of that algorithm via a sort of Bellman Ford style argument uh, was two to the K times M, where M is the number of edges in the graph. So multiplying out, that gives us a running time of quantity two times E raised to the K power times the number of edges M times log one over delta, where delta is the user supplied failure probability. So how should we feel about this running time? Well, it is beating the pants off of exhaustive search. Remember, in exhaustive search, you had to enumerate all ordered k tuples of vertices. Of, that's going to be scaling like n to the k. Here we have a running time bound that scales like a constant raised to the k. Constant's not as small as it was before. Now the constant's like 5.5. But still, for the values of n and k that we're talking about, k equal to like 10 or 20, and n equal to, say, in the hundreds or the thousands, 5.5 uh, to the k is way, way, way better than a running time of n to the k. n to the k would be useless really already for like k equals five. There is a special name for algorithms of this type, so exact algorithms for NP-hard problems, whose running time, while of course is exponential, sort of exponential in only a, a rather restricted way. So where the exponential dependence depends only on a particular parameter, sort of measuring the difficulty of the instance. So in the k-path problem, the parameter is just k. The longer the paths that you're looking for, the harder the problem gets. In general, algorithms that have exponential dependence only on parameters and are polynomial otherwise in the input size, those are known as fixed parameter algorithms. I encourage you to do a, a web search on that term if you want to learn more. And this particular fixed parameter algorithm actually made a, a pretty big a difference in the motivating application. Remember, at the beginning of this section, uh, we talked about the, the application of finding uh, long linear pathways in protein-protein interaction networks, so finding meaningful structure in biological networks. And uh, before color coding came along, uh, the state-of-the-art techniques were getting stuck you know, for pretty small values of k, maybe k around 10 or something like that. 
And with the invention of color coding, uh, so even all the way back in like 2007 or so, computers at that time, uh, this algorithm um, allowed computational biologists to find linear pathways of length up to 20, even in PPI networks that had thousands of vertices. So that really led them to understand the structure of these biological networks in a much deeper way than they could before. So that wraps up our discussion of the color coding algorithm and more generally uh, of exact algorithms for NP-hard problems that have provable running time bounds better than exhaustive search. Uh, for the rest of this chapter, for the rest of chapter 21, I wanna discuss uh, state-of-the-art technology that does not necessarily have provable running time bounds better than exhaustive search, but can be super effective for tackling uh, NP-hard problems in applications. State-of-the-art solvers for mixed integer programming and satisfiability. We'll start talking about that next. I'll see you then.